Well, good afternoon, everybody, and a warm welcome to uh, this webinar from the Institution of Mechanical Engineers, uh, the Food and Drink Engineering Committee. My name is Ed Koch. I'm the Vice Chair of the Food and Drink uh, Engineering Committee, and our topic today will be talking about developing urban growing systems. Before we get into it, let me just introduce our speakers for today. So, first up, we have um, Mr. Dylan Banks, who is the Chief Executive of Liberty Produce. Uh, Dylan is an academic turned entrepreneur and founder of Arsini Labs and co-founder of Lib Liberty Produce. Initially trained as a physicist and bioengineer, he has since held positions in in business and technology development and commercialization at Cambridge University and Imperial College London. And he works closely with the NHS, the Ministry of Defense, and other agencies and companies developing novel technologies and products. And then we also have today uh, Dr. Ed, Ed Hammond, who is um, principal at ECH Engineering. ECH Engineering is a Bristol-based SME specializing in developing appropriate technologies for the refrigeration and horticultural sectors. Their capabilities include mechanical engineering, electronic software, refrigeration, electrical insta installations, thermal management, lighting, and computational fluid dynamics. Managing Director Dr. Ed Hammond uh, gained his Master's of Mechanical Engineering at the University of Bath and a PhD in Retail Display Refrigeration at the University of Bristol. He is a member of the Institution of Mechanical Engineers and a Fellow of the Institute of Fed Refrigeration. Dr. Hammond's academic prowess is backed by years of commercial experience in the refrigeration industry and practical engineering skills. He currently works in HVAC design for controlled environments and vertical farms, bespoke refrigeration, electrical installations, and horticultural lighting. So welcome to our speakers and welcome to you all. Uh, just uh, very briefly, I'm going to introduce today's topic and then, and then hand over to uh, Dylan. So I think as um, you know, global demand grows, uh, driven by soaring populations um, and increased purchasing power, uh, it's becoming less and less sustainable to rely solely on traditional agriculture for food production. And this webinar really makes the case for urban or vertical farming as a sustainable source of crops. As opposed to rural farming, urban farming takes place in completely controlled environment. And uh, today we're going to hear um, from Liberty Produce, as we've said, and from Dr. Ed Hammond uh, explaining um, the, uh, uh, the benefits of vertical farming as a viable source of nutrition the considerations um, of crop selection, and some of the technical challenges facing, um, facing them. So I'm going to hand over then, uh, with, without further ado, uh, to Mr. Dylan Banks. Dylan. Uh, thank you very much, Ed. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Um, uh, I work for Liberty Produce, and uh, Liberty Produce, as has been introduced, is a technology development company specializing in the agri-tech space, and in particular within the controlled environment farming and vertical farming sectors. Um, we uh, originated out of uh, a technology de uh, development uh, company, and in many respects have attempted to address what we've seen as fundamentally important global challenges across the agri-food sector. Uh, and, and those are um, numerous. In the first instance, as, as Ed mentioned in his introduction, population growth is a compelling factor uh, to drive improvements to farming yields uh, internationally. Uh, and that makes, it's a fairly straightforward linear equation that as the number of people in the world increases, the, the, num the amount of food that they need to consume also increases with, with those populations. Uh, a compounding factor, which is exponentially uh, more compelling in terms of its driver to improve yields for crop farming, is the amount of available money that individuals have to spend globally. 
as as the general population acquires more the, uh, more ability to to purchase what they are what the trends that are, are being seen across the world are towards purchasing of, of meat products away from a vegetarian uh, only diet and the effects of this on crop farming are quite significant in in the in Europe and, and the US you, around 70% of uh, crops that are produced and uh, consumed go towards the farming of, of meat products, in particular cows, but, but also the, the remainder of the meat, meat uh, livestock products as well. And as that trend develops and increases around the world, the amount of crop production that is required to supply the feedstock for livestock production increases exponentially. And this, the rough number that appears to be um, um, you know, relatively well thought out, is that we're, we're going to have to double the, our food production by 2050. And that creates uh, a long-term pressure on farming capabilities that uh, already are under pressure for several reasons. Number one, is the the changes in the climate where differences in in weather extremes and unpredictability in weather patterns are leading to volatility in the marketplace and that's creating increases in prices and reduction in 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 yield capability across across the world and uh, in, in the UK, for instance, we've seen lettuces being flown from the US and elsewhere where shortages have occurred uh, due to weather conditions in, in Spain and elsewhere in Europe. The pressures beyond that are quite significant. One of the potential options to affect a positive um, difference in this marketplace is to look at indoor controlled farming and the benefits of indoor controlled farming as a conceptual uh, instrument are strong that you're growing inside of a box and you're controlling what goes into it and what comes out of it and so where there are issues not just to do with climate change um, but also to do with pesticide and herbicide and fungicide usage and the potential effects that that may have on the environment the 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 case for a a indoor um, an indoor farmed approach becomes ever stronger the issue with an indoor farming approach at this point in time from a sustainability perspective is that it is not sustainable. The, the amount of energy required to produce crops in a completely controlled indoor farm does not allow for, that, for those crops to be, um, to be produced at a price point that means that they're competitive in the marketplace, not only across the world, but also in, in, the, in the world's richest countries. And so that leads at the moment to crop supplies that are highly specialist and, and, and premium high value crops. The, uh, the, the, in spite of this, again, the fact that this is a, a box, a black box, one way, one way of looking at it, means that there are development activities that can be implemented to address these challenges. And that's where, where we come in. And so what we're effectively looking to do is to improve where we can the, uh, um, the operational effectiveness and the efficiency of crop production, driving it towards a more sustainable future. The benefits of this technology, if we can move in this direction, are significant. We can enable year-round production anywhere in the world. We can consistently produce high quality produce. We can improve crop flavor and nutritional content because we can apply just the right amount of 
light spectra and temperature, uh, just the right amount of other environmental conditions that create the per perfect conditions within the plant, commonly stressing those plants at just the right point in their growth phase to create particular flavors or other, other compounds um, or uh, uh, textural properties or other properties that mean that, that, that they're very tasty. Also, it means that where we're in a, a highly uh, a highly controlled and, and in many respects sanitized environment, we can broadly operate pesticide free. And so a lot of the issues with farming outside in terms of their usage of, of agrochemicals and those uh, the effects that that have both on the supply chain, the food chain, the, the consumers and the environment have got significant potential to be mitigated by growing in an indoor environment. And finally, the ability to grow locally to your marketplace offers the potential for significant reduction in food miles. At the moment, this also needs to be caveated with, with the bare fact that the energy consumption of, of growing indoors at the moment does not make this currently an environmentally sustainable uh, approach, coupled with the capex and the engineering costs and everything else. We are, however, moving towards addressing those issues. So within Liberty, our vision is to bring the best tools of sustainable farming through innovative hardware, software, and services to our customers who are the growers of today and tomorrow. And in that, we work with farmers of big and small uh, capabilities, both here in the UK and internationally, to explore the capabilities and benefits that, that these new technologies can provide in assisting not only within the controlled environment and fully uh, indoor farming environment, but also sometimes outside and in glasshouse and elsewhere. Our mission is to commercialize the next generation of these technologies, bringing, uh, as I said, the operational and capital costs of these of, of the uh, of, of the of the products down to the point whereby it opens up the market opportunity to uh, to, to to make uh, indoor farming commercially viable for mainstream crop production. Um, secondly, we develop and validate technology in the vertical farming environments. And uh, my next slide will show you uh, a short video introducing our research and development uh, center in, in uh, the James Hudson Institute in, in Dundee. And thirdly, we drive forwards the sustainable production of crops. And that encompasses everything that I've been describing around the mechanisms of implementation of, of improving these technologies, but also looking at mechanisms to couple within the, the broader uh, uh, supply chain, and, and by that specifically um, the energy market sectors, to look at how we can implement in a, in a net zero carbon and uh, reduced energy cost environment. So with that, I'll Stephen leave McManamy. this video. Could this be the answer to feeding ever-growing populations around the world? A new facility at the James Hutton Institute uses the latest technology to grow crops inside shipping containers. The work going on here is seen as vital to help the UK maintain crop requirements for the future. But it could also be used in countries where crops consistently fail. This model, given that it's a container-based system, can be shipped anywhere around the world. It's not reliant on the natural environment at all. It's fully self-contained. We're controlling the environment within it. This mode of farming looks set to be a growth industry. Steve McMenemy, STV News. So that's the, uh, uh, the future farming hub. And within this environment, which is a, a, con a container-based environment, um, we've built it that way principally so that it's, it, could be, uh, it, could, it could be moved. And um, uh, it offers some interesting properties from the testing and development aspect in terms of its modularity. Um, specifically, we're not uh, looking to commercialize 
um, in terms of commercial growing environments um, within the container systems, except for in instances whereby um, whereby there are specific benefits to, to growing within a containerized system, such as disaster relief. What we look to do is to work with organizations that are looking to in, in, implement and install relatively large growing um, systems, anything of the order of 1,000 meters squared of, of, of uh, growing area up to 5,000 and sometimes larger uh, meters squared of growing area. Again, typically to look at uh, herb production and what's called microgreen production at the moment. And where we're looking to drive that marketplace is into enabling more mainstream crops, baby leaf salads and, and other products to, uh, uh, um, to uh, enable a, a greater market share for this technology. So our products typically are looking to holistically improve the quality and the yield of, of the produce that is being produced to reduce the operational expenditure and to reduce the capital expenditure. We have got particular expertise in, in the lighting systems, in the sensor systems and the control systems that work within that. And we are, uh, uh, we're, we're acutely aware that the, the, the system of a whole or the system of systems approach of understanding um, how the farm will operate requires very close integration with the other control systems and the, the environmental control systems in particular, such as the, the heating and ventilation systems. And it's out of these, um, the need to be able to achieve these things that the, the relationship with that we've developed with Ed and uh, his leading capabilities in the HVAC and other control and, and lighting areas has, has, has really flourished and developed. We, sorry, Ms. We uh, look specifically to increase revenue by allowing for crops to be grown with greater fresh weight and dry weight produce. And what that means is that the, um, the, uh, the way we achieve this is simply to, to look to Im improve, Im improve light, and I'll go into that in a bit more detail, which also allows for us to improve the range of crops that we can produce. Uniformity is a really important thing because that produces wastage. Um, the, the more consistent and the more quality, the closer the, 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 the quality that you can produce to the best quality that you need um, for the crops that you produce, the, the, the less waste that you have in anything that you produce. By um, looking at uh, enhanced um, phenotype expression of um, uh, control of the environmental conditions, we can bring out particular um, aspects of characteristics of those crops, be they um, flavor or texture or some other aspect. And one of the, the particular benefits that Liberty offers is the ability for bespoke design, which means that the systems that we implement are, um, are custom tailored to the needs and requirements of our customers. And what these allow, by doing these things, these allow for us to significantly improve the energy efficiency, which reduces capital uh, co um, operational expenditure. We look to significantly reduce capital expenditure on these products. We've got a, we've got a vertically integrated supply chain for, for quite a significant portion of our product portfolio. Um, by design for manufacture and, and, and good design for operations, we've reduced uh, the control and, and maintenance requirements. And ultimately, the value proposition is to be able to reduce the risk of, uh, of the farming business model as a whole, which leads to the an improved ability for growers and operators to, to raise capital and finance against their propositions. Um, and uh, finally, by designing uh, products in, in particular ways, it means you can reduce the installation. And the installation costs are, are a significant portion of the farm build, and, and so something that are very important for us to look at. Okay, sorry. So our, our lighting product, which I won't dwell on because I can see that I'm um, starting to run short of time, uh, is the Folio Nova product with a, a, a custom LED set, which has been designed 
to to optimize for the growing of produce within uh, within the indoor farming environment and this is specifically tailored for uh, for, for relatively small and early stage growth of of herbs and, and microgreens up to about 230 240 micromoles micromoles are a measurement of the amount of light that's being absorbed by the plant it correlates with the number of electrons that are photosynthesizing uh, within the leaf um, uh, well going through a photosynthetic process within within the leaves um, we we have two product lines actually sorry one that goes up to 320 and one that goes up to 240 the reason why we've chosen that number is uh, that, you, as you can see from this graph, which is from, from empirical measurements and data sets and trials that we've done, that by increasing the, uh, the brightness, you can effectively increase the, the mass of the plants within a shorter time, which means you can make more profit out of it per, per square meter. The issue with, with doing that is that you have excess heat because these lights are not 100% efficient, and that needs to be managed. And again, that fits into a close understanding of why why it's so important to work holistically with the whole of the farming system, i.e. tying the lights in with the heating and ventilation and, and, and other aspects. Specifically, one of the benefits that we can offer is the ability to tune our lighting spectrum, and we uh, have uh, a vertically integrated supply chains through both China and Taiwan um, to where we can develop our own phosphor lighting and, and um, in to implement that within a fully standardized uh, manufacturing and a supply chain basis that allows for us to service customers uh, uh, globally. Secondly, we've been developing a, a hydro bubble system, and that system is is, is really fascinating, um, and it's, it's 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 a nascent area within this area, but effectively. We're making bubbles that are so small that they don't have the buoyancy to be able to move the surface tension of the water, and so they stay within the water for uh, a relatively long period of time. The smaller you make those bubbles, the, the longer they stay within the water. And the basic proposition is this. You put the bubbles into the water, so there's air in the water, and you can control those gases as well. Um, you can then allow for those bubbles to um, filter through your hydroponic system or other water delivery system to close to the roots or actually at the roots and then these bubbles stick to the roots and allow for increased oxygen and increased air and increased carbon dioxide and other gases to, to reach those plants through those roots and that correlates directly with a yield boost and so um, with a relatively cost-effective uh, bubble generation tool and um, with the ability to, to inject these bubbles into uh, into the, the nutrient uh, feeds, we can we we've shown that we can uh, get yield boosts of anything between 20 and 50 percent, depending on what it is that we're growing and how we're and how we're comparing that measurement. And this is really significant in terms of being able to um, improve the yields of of, of, of these plants. A second area that we're exploring in this space, which is really interesting, the plants need carbon dioxide at night, and these bubbles offer a, the potential to inject, in, in, inject carbon dioxide um, through the, the, the nutrient solution at night, um, creating a, a bank of carbon dioxide that can be absorbed by the root, root mass overnight, boosting again the yield of the plants without having to put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Um, which, co which causes problems for any workers working in, in, in the environment. And by doing this, we're hoping that we, are, we may have the ability to address uh, um, the, a, a, an, an effective usage of cap captured carbon that can be um, put, put into solution in this way. So um, just to sum up, uh, if I can move to the next slide. Um, this is our team. Um, it's myself. Um, um, uh, we, we don't actually have a CEO. I, I maybe to, to, to go over those things, but I'm the technical, technical director. And my background is in physics and engineering. Um, we also have uh, Dana Chapman, who's our operations director, Alexander Giles, our commercial director, uh, Philippe Montenegro, who's our horticulture director, and Benita Rajania, who's our marketing director. And um, we're, 
this is a, a photo of us at, uh, at the opening of our facility in, in Dundee. And we are all very open and, and, and uh, we'll be happy to communicate with you and answer any of your questions uh, now or to a later point. Um, on this slide deck, there are, there are some emails with both Zainer and myself here. Um, but uh, thank you very much for your time. And um, I look forward to answering some questions later. Great, thank you, Ed, uh, Dylan. Thanks very much. I'm now going to um, hand over to uh, Dr. Ed Hammond. Hi, right, thank you. And um, so I'm going to try and talk a little bit more around the engineering side of uh, and the engineering challenges side of vertical farming. And I, I think. For me, and what I've found with all the projects so far, is, is the biggest challenge is defining the problem. You've got to correctly define the problem before engineering the solution to it. An incomplete or incorrect specification will just lead you to an incorrect solution. I think engineers are very good problem solvers, but they tend to be very enthusiastic about their own ideas and inventions or technologies. And the skill we really need to develop is to be able to apply the appropriate technology to the right problems. So uh, I think that, you know the requirements of the plants I think are generally very well known by the, the, the people growing them. But we mustn't draw the system boundary too small. Our specification has to be quite broad. What we're trying to build is the basis of a machine to feed people or a business you know if, if the thing can't pay for itself it's, it's not going to stack up so D Dylan talked a lot about this system of systems and the integration uh, and what I've put on this slide here it's a bit like the, uh, the sort of tower of cards there's a lot of component parts and if you define those incorrectly you can find yourself led towards solving that wrong problem so make sure you remember you're, you're producing food at the end of this. That food has to try and be sold to make money to cover your costs. We, we've heard that there's been a lot of vertical farms which have been reported to have failed. I, I think, well, they didn't necessarily fail. They were all growing stuff very well. Um, but lessons were learned. And some of the biggest lessons that, that, that have really come out of them, the, the feedback has said, think about maintenance. Things go wrong, things break, things need changing. Think about how you're going to do that in the design of what you're putting together. Cleanliness. And uh, one, one of the companies said, if, if you can't clean it, don't build it. And there's a number of different ways of looking at that. There's, there's pe people have engineered farms where everything is perfectly clean. It's, everything has to be clean. It's built like a, like a clean room. Nothing enters or no dirt enters or... or into that chamber you, you prevent prevent that other ways of doing it you say well no no it's going to get dirty we just wash it down so we make everything movable um but it, it's all got to be there in the design and you have to think about the scale you're operating at think about how you're going to run this farm and and the logistics even of, of just moving either the individual components that whether, whether it be seeds or the plants or the, the produce or the people around in, in this space. How are you getting rid of the waste? What's the what is the waste? Is it recyclable? Is it you know how how are you going to dispose of it? What about the energy supply? That's another one. And uh, Dylan mentioned the energy supply is a big cost, and that may may force you into uh, certain types of crop, or only only being able to apply certain levels of light. I mean, we can, we can deliver you some very powerful lights. We, we can grow fruits. We can grow trees if you want. It's just not very sensible. But you, you have to have in your specification, and, and anyone who knows me will know I always bang on about the specification, but the specification is important, and it must consider all of those factors. So the main thing to remember, I think, from, from my talk is get your specification right, and then we can come in as engineers and we'll solve the correct problem for you. I, I even had one, well, I've got two, two recent customers, just as an example, two recent customers have come to me. 
they have target budgets. One is a tenth of the other customer. So there's two people solving apparently the same problem. They both want to grow food in a vertical farm. One of them's done all their calculations and specifications, has come up with one budget. The other has come up with a budget tenfold. And that's all about getting this plan, this, this, this um, what's their, what is their business plan? What is their return on investment going to be? How are they going to achieve it? How much operational effort are they going to put in? How much robotic effort are they going to put in? How much hardware are they going to use to try and reduce the labor? They're all solving different problems, and it's get that specification written and understood so that we can, we can then design that solution for you. So we can work on solutions at very different levels. Now the next, I, I tried, and I apologize for the, the small text on this slide, but I, I, I tried to make pictorial what the energy balance on the system looks like, because it is relatively complex. And it, even this is grossly oversimplified insofar as it's a, a snapshot in time and only focuses on one operating mode. But if we look at the energy movements around the system, you could see from that there could be places uh, where you could recover heat energy. So by using thermal stores and, and the heat recovery pump on the top right there, you, you, you can use waste heat or surplus heat from, from lighting or, or that we've removed from our, our grow environment. And we can either store it and use it for reheat after the night, or we can use it in another adjacent process nearby if, if there is such a process. Um, we talked about the lighting, and one of the systems I developed was water-cooled lighting. That enabled us to take a large amount of that electrical energy supply to the LEDs to be removed as sensible heat um, in, in, in a water loop rather than in the airflow. And I'll come on to the airflow and the air handlers in, in a minute, and you'll see why that's useful. But also look at the it, within the yellow box and the green background, where your actual growing environment, there's a conversion of energy down there at the plants. Now, your entire growing system, whether you're growing on matting, whether you're doing aeroponics, hydroponics, there's so many different ways. And that, it, that growing system will influence how much evaporation you get from your benches or the, the transpiration from the plants is influenced by the, the vapor pressure differences, the leaf temperatures. There's a lot of factors about everyone's individual growing environment or growing setup that influences the exact ratios of these heat transfers and movements of water. But very simple experiments, building small-scale facilities will give you that understanding. You'll be able to put percentages on each of these arrows. You can say, okay, well, a third of it's going that way. You can say two-thirds is going into it. And, and you can start to quantify things, and that will really help you with these early-stage, small-scale experiments. It will really help you to understand the system you're trying to build. Um, so even if you, you don't want to do the calculations behind any of this, there's very practical ways where you can still solve that problem without having to get into the detailed calculations and engineering there. And so one of the, 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 the big problems that you'll, you'll come to with uh, traditional HVAC equipment is the, uh, the, the amount of air flow that we need or the air, the air volume that we need to move around. If you were to take a, a specific load, um, heat load, we say 10 kilowatts, you go out and you buy um, a typical air conditioning system for 10 kilowatts. And it's kind of painting by numbers. Hooray! Put that in the corner. Job done. Not entirely. Your typical load in buildings is, is a much higher proportional of sensible load to latent. And you're also able in, in, in the larger, more open spaces to get much better mixing of the air coming off of those units. So what you'll typically find is that the air volumes will be far too small on those units. And so you won't get good conditions throughout your space. You will not get good temperature control or tight temperature control. You will not get good control of humidity within your grow space. So your solutions really that you're left with are to try and engineer bespoke kit. It's perfectly doable. Um, and that, that will, you, you can then design that to have a much larger primary airflow for the, the duty that you're trying to achieve. Or you, you could try to use a, a secondary airflow system, so getting the ventilation that's required near the plant. So the plant gets the right air movement, um, the, the, the right gas exchange can, can happen at the plant itself. 
Because you'll find the the racks that we're growing on are very often quite tightly packed. You want to get as much as we can within to the space that 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 we have available and trying to persuade the air to just flow over those plants when you've got a huge rack of shelves. It's extremely difficult without an awful lot of ductwork. The air just wants to run down the aisles. Well, that's not where the heat load is. That's not where the moisture is being generated. Um, so we, we need to seriously consider within any space, how are we going to move the air around in this space? Now, I've done some very simple diagrams here. Um, this is just looking at, at airflow. Now, obviously, there's no racks in this. It's, it's, it's just to get you thinking, really. And obviously, we can do computational fluid dynamics. We can simulate airflows within a space. It's not... It, it, it's time-consuming, but it's important. Now, clearly, what I've drawn as a diagram here is, is, is no use without racks on it, but really, you do need to think to make space within your growing environment for the system which will provide your airflow. Without the right airflow within that growing environment, you will not get good, homogenous, consistent, ideal growing conditions. You must have the right airflow. So start early on in your designs with designing an ideal airflow, an ideal way of laying the racks out, because it's a compromise you will regret if you come to add the, the HVAC later. Um, another thing I, I do want to introduce is air handlers, um, because every job I've come to so far, people have been shocked at how big they are. Um, we've got a lot of air to move. You can't do that in a small space. The heat exchangers are necessarily quite large in order to be efficient. Now, the one in the, the picture here is, is, is for, it was actually a, a, an environmental chamber for testing refrigerated cabinets, but the, 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 the system is, is, is very simple. It, 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 it is the same. It's a very simple water loops to, to do the heat, the, the cooling and heating and a, a humidifier in the foreground. Typically, what will happen in an air handler, you will, at, at, at the, the start of it, you will introduce any fresh air mixing that we want to do. So if we're bringing in outside air to do the, the fresh air replacement, we will bring that in at the start. We then do filtration. Next, we have our fan. So we've got to move the air. Then we will dehumidify. Now, you can dehumidify at the cooling coil, or you can have two separate coils. There, is a, there are advantages to using the, the face and bypass dampers in a separate dehumidification, but effectively the first process, get rid of excess moisture from that air. Get rid of any surplus sensible heat from that air. Now, if in the event of getting rid of the, what you see, you've got reheat as well. Often, by the time we've done the dehumidification, the air is too cold and we need reheat. So at point six here, we've got, we're adding the heat. So we're then sending the air back into the chamber at the desired temperature. So heat, and the very final stage is humidify. In a growing environment, um, it, it's un, unlikely that you're going to need to add humidification because your benches are effectively a, a giant a humidifier. Um, but you may want to add humidification for, for germination rooms and the like. So that's your process. That's, that's the sort of size of thing. That, that's, you're, you're looking at about 1.2 meters by 1.2 meters in section on that, uh, and that assembly in that picture there is about 6.5 meters long. Um, uh, that, that is good for about 30 kilowatts, just as a rough guide. Um, so that's fresh air mixing at the start, filtration, fan, dehumidify, cool, heat, and then humidify. That is your air handler. Oh, it seems to be slow to change. Let's try that again. Yep, here we go. Okay, now fresh air. Fresh air ventilation is something that er uh, people often ask about. This is taken from ASHRAE. Um, it's, it's based on livestock buildings. Uh, and the reason I've put this in is because there's a lot more information out there, or I found more easily, a lot more information about livestock buildings. They're, same, same, they're, they're solving the same kind of problem. Um, so there's, there's a couple of parts to it. The first, the lower line A, which is, is, is a sort of a almost horizontal line on the diagram, 
is the small amount of airflow, the small ventilation rate that you'd need in order to do the, the CO2 replacement or the fresh air ventilation um, or CO2 removal in the case of livestock. B, which is the, the shallower curve, is moisture removal. So we've got an amount of moisture that we have to remove. You, you have to do a lot more fresh air ventilation in order to do that. Then if we want to do temperature control, again, we, we've still got a lot more air to move. And there is a practical limit. So the horizontal line at the top of the diagram, D, is the practical limit. How much air can we actually move? And so it very often becomes impossible to move enough air to get free cooling, as it's often referred to. And the other compromises, if we look at the ratios A, B, C, they don't all cross over together. So you're never going to satisfy the minimum ventilation for all of them. So you'll often have to overventilate, and it's like, ah, oh, well, now I've got the right humidity, but I'm at the wrong temperature. Or I've got the right temperature, but still my humidity is not right. And so you still need the air handler. And it's very useful. It's very useful insofar as it is often cheaper than mechanical cooling. But you do have to filter that air. You do have to have ductwork capable of moving those kind of air volumes. And you do still need your air handler. You'll never completely replace that, that air handler because there still will be some adjustment to that air temperature or humidity in order to satisfy everything. Uh, and just finally, um, uh, I'm just going to give just a few more examples of um, facilities just to give you an idea of scale. This was... Um, a facility for refrigeration testing. You can see the air handlers. There were three big chambers there within that, that warehouse. That's what your, your, your clean room kind of setup is going to look like from the, the outside. And there's a lot of space above it. Notice how big the ceiling void is. This is another facility that we had at, um, this one actually went in at Stockbridge. Uh, now, they'd, they'd built their farm um, before they approached me about the environmental control. So on this job, we actually ended up putting the air handlers outside, and we had to duck the air back in. You can see in, in the image there, we can see the, uh, the air handlers, the thermal stores, and the heat recovery package. Um, but as I say, the, the air handlers ended up outside. Simply the size of them is significant. Um, and Dylan did touch on um, the data acquisition and monitoring. There's a number of different systems that we, we build for doing that. It's very important to be able to map your environment. Uh, on the bottom right there is our, our latest uh, version, which is a, a wireless battery-powered system. You can scatter those around a three-dimensional space, and then the software will then enable you to map that space out in terms of temperature, carbon dioxide, humidity. Um, so you get a really good understanding of your space. So if you're uncertain whether your airflow is working, there's a way of proving it um, and finding where the problem zones are within that space. Um, and then lighting, again, is something that we've, we've mentioned a few times. So we've got our, our water-cooled lights. Um, we can run those, anything from about 40 watts. We do. I, I often work in the electrical input because I'm interested in the heats. Um, so 40 watts per linear meter up to 300 watts per linear meter of that extrusion. So it becomes very cost-effective light to produce, and obviously we can recover a lot of heat from it. Uh, the top right image there is a 500-watt um, LED. Um, that's about the size of your fist, that one, as a rough guide to scale. Uh, putting out 500 watts and weighs less than a kilo. Um, bottom left is a, a multi-spectral one, and there's a, a, a controller as well. So there's a range of different technologies, and it, you really have to, as I say, get your specification right, and then go shopping for your technologies, because we have a number of uh, different solutions. Okay, that's, that's all from me. Thank you. Well, thank you, Ed, and uh, thank you again to Dylan. So uh, thank you uh, to both the speakers. We've got about 16 minutes left before we, we close out, and we have had a, a number of uh, really interesting questions come up. So uh, we've got some time now for Q&A. If you do have any further questions, you can just uh, type them in um, uh, into the um, on the right-hand side of the media player there. So there's a couple of questions, first of all, about, I guess, the demand for uh, food production. So, uh, I mean, firstly, with the growing trend in veganism and, and um, perhaps as meat requirements drop, 
Uh, is this trend also impacting on the need for food, this uh, type of more intensive food production? Maybe uh, D Dylan, do you want to take that one? Sure. I mean, um, it's certainly. Uh, I mean, it's a it's a really interesting question. The uh, the reality of the situation is, I think that we need to we need to go where the mark where the market trends are and and there is a certainly a move towards veganism um in in the european and north american uh areas and that's that's measurable um nonetheless um meat consumption consumption here and globally is is increasing significantly and uh, it is it is the case that if more and more people became uh vegan or uh, vegetarian that um there will be significant differences in in the requirements for, for for crop production. Having said that, that's a different challenge to 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 the one that we're addressing. We're 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 expect we're we're trying to address the the the, the, the situation is is right now, which is that the vast majority of the the world want to uh, or are consuming meat. Right, right. Thanks for thanks for that. And and, I, and then I guess related to the demand um, is I mean you mentioned at the start of your talk uh, that uh, we'd have to double food production by 2050. Uh, there's, there's, would not a reduction of food waste be a, be another issue to focus on, um, or, or another form of saving? And perhaps is this type of urban growing system. Uh, Sorry, do you want me to answer that? Yeah, or, go ahead. Yeah, sorry, Dylan. Of course. Yeah, no problem at all. Yeah, so um, no, it's absolutely the case that large amounts of uh, food is wasted, both in the in the field, um, some in transit and logistics, and then a lot in the home. Uh, and uh, those two areas um, where food is wasted in the field because of environmental impacts and food is wasted in the home because of uh, consumer uh, habits um, are areas where significant uh, changes can be made and those are areas that we are looking at trying to to to, to address certainly in terms of your, the ability to grow indoors you can mitigate quite significantly the the wastage in the field uh, but having said that, that that wastage in the field is already priced into the price of, of produce as it is paid right now, and um, the competitive difference between uh, the the cost of indoor farming and 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 the out, and outside farming takes into account that waste. So from a financial commercial perspective, um, it's that's already fully accounted for. Um, in terms of food usage and and the idea of not wasting food. There are there are several approaches. One of which is to um, uh, to, to let's say to be more efficient with it, and the other is to find better usage usages of those foods products that otherwise would be wasted, anaerobic digestion, digestion, and other other uh, uh, alternative um, feedstock sources can be utilised in many respects for this for those kinds of things. So um, you to, to answer that um, more just just more fully the outcome of uh, of food wastage is is inefficiencies in that supply chain and those are areas that we are looking to improve upon principally to drive the the economic viability of indoor growing and ultimately to enable a more sustainable future for for our population as a whole but i really need to caveat that by saying we're a long way away from from um, being wholly efficient and wholly sustainable, as I said, uh, in, in many respects of this. Right, right, right. Well, thanks. I mean, that um, uh, that that is uh, really um, really insightful. And then um, perhaps for Ed, there were a number of questions around uh, the um, uh, the carbon footprint and uh, the use of waste, heat, and carbon dioxide. So. And how does Hello, right. 
I seem to I seem to be losing audio. Me too, Ed. Um, I can hear you. Okay. Um, I'll I'll carry on and hope that the audience can hear us. Okay. Um, yeah. In terms of carbon footprint, yes, we need to minimise the amount of energy input to these facilities because we have to be realistic. We can't just keep feeding endless electricity into to creating food. The um, Carbon using, I see a question here about uh, using waste carbon dioxide and heat from industrial processes. Well, it, within commercial glasshouse production, we're already harvesting carbon dioxide off the back of the, the heaters that are used to to keep the uh, glasshouses warm. So in, in some ways, we are already doing that, and there have been vertical farms that have looked to co-locate with um, energy generation. Um, so if you've got um, sort of biomass type generators, there's a lot of heat around, there's a lot of electricity around, and so we can use those to fuel vertical farms. Um, just looking down, I think we may have lost um, Ed, who's been moderating the questions, so I'll just look down at a few others here. Um, ways of mitigating energy disruption, um, generators are really the only way. Um, or if you've got a hybrid type system. So these growing systems, I've, I've been involved in projects whereby we're just adding additional lighting and control to glass houses. So of course you get a lot more tolerance than where, where, with, with the power going out. Otherwise I'm afraid it ends up coming down to generation systems. But let's say co-locating with um, other generation systems, um, biodigesters and things are, are, are becoming more um, more widely investigated. Uh, we've got another question here. Types of system that can be used as home. Yes, there are systems um, I mean, which can Ed, be designed that, for home use. Sorry? Ed, on that note, I mean, I think it's fascinating to, to look at the co-location and the twinning of indoor growing systems with energy generation systems. The, you know, the possibility of uh, an off-grid uh, supply system where you know the equivalent of a power purchase agreement can be put in place reducing um, the you know, the effective electricity costs which are significant in any of these indoor farming systems can really look to open up uh, the, the, those markets in many respects and again that I think that's a really important area for for, for the industry as a whole to to understand and consider because of the um, the, you know, the significance of electricity prices, um, and you know, we can predict, we know what we're going to be consuming in terms of electricity because we know what we're growing and we know what we're going to be consuming for the next week and the next month, etc. And so, um, I, you know, one of the things that we're hoping to do is to increasingly work with uh, energy uh, um, producers, to, in particularly in the renewable space, to understand. How, how best we can maximize efficiencies for for each other in, as a, us as an energy consumer uh, uh, and and for them as as uh, uh, that energy market in, is of itself evolving um, to be a, a good a good uh, consumer for them excellent thanks Ed. thanks very much um, so there's some interesting questions about, uh, I guess, about scalability. So there's a question here around, um, you know, if I wish to start an enterprise and, and commerce um, growing food, food via a container, as, as we saw in your presentation, how much would that startup cost? What? Okay. Well, I'll... I'll... I'll, I'll come in a little bit there. I mean, I, I, I'm involved in a number of projects with, with different people, and we're looking at equipment, everything from the home user, um, so very, very low cost of entry, um, right up to um, the larger scale farm. So we're looking at building equipment that's scalable for putting into a, a very small you know, spare room in an office block um, or growing in the corner of a restaurant right up to these kind of mega farms. So I think it comes down to the level of technology. Uh, say I've, I'm working with, with, with different customers, and it, it's about deciding what you want 
the system to grow and how much input you're prepared to put there. Um, at the moment, we're, we're working on things from a few hundred pounds per square meter up to a few thousand pounds a square meter. And obviously, <laughs> um, there's, there's a big difference between the systems. Um, but my, my hunch is that for most of these very small production spaces, you're, you're not going to be using the, kind of the, t the typical kind of hydroponic systems that are used on the very large setups. You're going to be going for the very much simpler, you know, just a larger version of the home use cabinets where we are only looking at a few hundred pounds per square meter. Right, that's very interesting, and that and that's also one of the, uh, answered one of the other questions where, where um, uh, somebody asked, can the similar types of systems be used for home use? Yeah, and I, I'm I'm still developing it at the moment, but it's it's going to be one of the we're hoping by May to have the the home use uh, system out there, uh, be under uh, Undercover Farms brand. Um, so that one, that one is coming. <laughs> Not there yet, I'm afraid, but it's it, it, it's on its way. <laughs> uh, okay, we've just got a couple more minutes, and there's there's um, some there's some interesting questions here from uh, both Robin and and Ruth about uh, the quality, I guess, of the produce. So um, you know, the focus has been on food production, uh, but uh, there's a there's question here, I know from experience, particularly of salad leaves, that the best taste and texture comes from leaves freshly picked in a greenhouse. Um, and can uh, the speakers see a future where this kind of automated um, salad production is closer to consumption, such as shops, cafes, and homes? And, and you know, the, is there a difference in uh, taste and texture? Yeah, well, that's a, a big part of the, um, there's a group called Grow Bristol, who I do a lot of work with, and their grow model is all about growing very local to the consumer um, or the, the restaurant. And I know that they're, where they get sales and where they win is, is that often actually against, winning against the glasshouse grower um, because they are producing very locally and delivering fresh, and they're winning on flavor. Um, so there, there does seem to be a lot in that. Okay, that's um, that's well, that's good to know. And the um, uh, then uh, um, some questions just around automation. What role does uh, robotics and automation have in the vertical farming systems? Uh, probably D Dylan probably has worked more on on the robotics th than I have. Um, I don't know if you've got any thoughts on that, Dylan. I think they have their place, but not everywhere is is about as much as I I would want to say on that. Yeah, I think that uh, sums it up. I mean, you, you, when you roughly break down the the, the operational costs of these farms, uh, electricity costs equate to about a third. Labour cost costs equate to about a third, and and your other costs equate to about a, you know, the, the remainder of the third. So labor and, and electricity are, are your two main costs. And so automation as a mechanism of reducing those labor costs is, um, is, is a highly um, uh, uh, interesting area. The, the key trade-off is to look at the, the, the cost of implementation of the robotic system against uh, the, 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 the farm system as a whole, which would need to be amateurized over the lifetime of, of, of that farm. And right. so um, really it's a question of, uh, of, 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 of cost. Um, the, so you could have a fully automated um, farm with, with very little human intervention, and it may, uh, it, it may function perfectly well, but may not be economically viable to implement that because of the cost of the robotics within that system. And so looking at um, interesting but low cost automating automation capabilities is an area where us and, and numerous groups around the, the world are also looking. And interestingly, um, groups that have got particular expertise in logistics, particularly warehouse logistics, um, are, are, are expressing um, significant interest in this vertical farming space, and I think rightly so, because they've cracked a lot of the uh, a lot of those robotic logistical issues, and there is potentially significant crossover value into this space. So I think that you know, what I would say 
view, if I was to sum up the robotic angle at the moment, is that it's uh, it's it's uh, it, in many respects it's an earlier stage question in terms of the value proposition within the vertical farming space. But I would not be surprised in the in the least if over the next two to three years that there's, there's more automation and even fully automated systems um, uh, made it to the mainstream arena. Oh, thanks, thanks very much for that, Dylan. I see um, that we're out of time, and, and unfortunately, I mean, there are a lot more questions, so there's um, clearly a lot of interest in, uh, in the presentations, but uh, we are out of time, so I'm going to have to um, close it there. But once again, thank you very much to, uh, to Dylan Banks and to Dr. Ed Hammond um, for a fascinating talk on developing urban growing systems. Uh, thank you to, all, to, to both of them and to everyone who dialed in and all the questions that came through. Thank you very much.